हेलो एवरीबॉडी दिस इज डॉक्टर विशाल त्रिवेदी फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायो साइंसेज एंड बायो इंजीनियरिंग आई गुवाहाटी एंड सो फॉर व्हाट वी हैव डिस्कस वी हैव डिस्कस अबाउट द डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ एंटीजन एंटीबॉडी इंटरेक्शंस वेयर वी हैव डिस्कस अबाउट द एक्रोटेशन रिएक्शन वी हैव डिस्कस अबाउट द रेडियल इम्यूनो एसेज वी हैव डिस्कस अबाउट द प्रेसिपिटेशन रिएक्शंस एंड इन द प्रीवियस लेक्चर वी हैव ऑल्सो डिस्कस अबाउट द इम्यूनो एसेज सो विद इन द इम्यूनो एसे वी हैव डिस्कस अबाउट द डायरेक्ट एलाइजा एज वेल एज द इनडायरेक्ट एलाइजा सो नाउ सब्सिक्वेंट टू दैट वी आर ऑल्सो गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट द सैंडविच एलाइजा सैंडविच एलाइजा इज एक्चुअली अ डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ सेटअप दिस सेटअप इज यूज टू मेजर द लेवल ऑफ एंटीजन सच एज द इंसुलिन इन द सीरम and in the direct elisa setup a known amount of antibody is specific uh, antibody to capture the antigen the antigen is then recognized by the secondary antibody linked to the enzyme a colorimetric substrate is used to measure the level of antigen so the in the sandwich elisa you use the two antibodies one is the capture antibody so what you can do is first you take the well and then you coat this well with a capturing antibody and then you add your antigen of interest for example in this case it is insulin so you add the uh, your patient sample and then the insulin or the antigen is going to bind to this capture antibody then you do a washing step and then you add the additional primary antibody so that actually is going to recognize the antigen again and then you add the secondary antibody which is actually going to recognize this antibody instead of this antibody and then you are going to add the substrate and that actually is going to give you the product which is going to be uh, color in nature and that's how you can be able to measure the level of antigen present in the patient sam uh, sample or the biological fluid so the purpose of sandwich elisa is to measure the antigen whereas the purpose of indirect elisa is to measure the level of antibody present in the blood so in this method a capture antibody is used to collect the antigen from the sample afterwards a second antibody is used to detect the antigen bound to the capture antibody the second antibody is directed against the antigen using a unique distinct epitope the antibody is linked to the biotin and that can be recognized by the avidin or streptavidin hrp complex in the last step the peroxidase substrate is used to get a readouts so when you use the so when you immobilize the capture antibodies the antigen goes and bind to the capture antibody then you use the detection antibody which is actually going to use the different epitope present on to the same antigen and then you have the option of either using the secondary antibody or you can use the biotin avidin kind of recognition system and then you are going to add the substrate and that actually substrate is going to be processed by the hrp uh, hrp means harsh reddish peroxidase and that actually is going to give you the colored product and that colored product can be recognized by the colorimetric assays so let's see how to do that and what are the materials are required so first is you require a capture antibody so in this case we are showing you uh, uh, the elisa for the tnf alpha from the patient sample so you are using the anti mouse tnf alpha uh, monoclonal antibody it is 1:250 uh, dilution is used for coating into the coating buffer using the elisa plate then you require a detection antibody so biotinylated anti mouse hrp tnf alpha monoclonal antibody is used and uh, the recommended 1 is to 500 dilution is required in the reaction buffer for detecting the tnf alpha in the sample then then you require the enzyme substrate so streptavidin harsh peroxidase conjugate is being used as a detection system and then you require the standard so in the case of this you actually need the mouse tnf alpha Uh, standard so that you can be able to perform the standard reaction so that you will be able to measure the level of tnf alpha into the uh, patient samples and the enzyme treatment uh, hrp conjugate so this is the substrate what you require to use and a recommended dilution is 1 is to 250 in a uh, to detect the tnf alpha in the sample
apart from that you require a coating buffer so this is the composition of the coating buffer the coating buffer has to be prepared fresh and you have to use that in the span of seven days then you require the assay diluent so assay diluent is a pbs which actually can be used to prepare the different dilutions of uh, samples then you require the wash buffer so wash buffer contains the pbs plus 220 and then you require the substrate solution which is the tmb and the hydrogen peroxide and then once the reaction is over then you require the stop solution which contains the uh, h3po4 or the sulfuric acid then you require the 96l plate for doing the uh, elisa and then you require the microplate reader which actually can be able to capture the absorbance at 450 nanometer and then you require the micropipette tubes and the plate or the parafilm. The step one, in the step one you have to collect the specimen or the sample from the patient or the biological fluid. So in the step one you have to do a specimen collection and the handling, the specimen should be clear non hemolyzed and non lipidemic in the case of cell culture the remove any particulate matter by centrifugation and assay immediately or store the sample at minus 20 degrees celsius avoid repeated freeze thawing cycle so even if you preserve the sample at minus 20 you should not repeat the freeze thawing cycle because as many times you do the freeze thawing cycle it is actually going to damage the antigens what is present inside the sample and that actually is going to reduce its cross reactivity whereas in the case of patient blood use a serum separating tube and allow the sample to clot for 30 minutes and then centrifuge for 10 minutes so in the case if you are processing with the patient blood you do not need the blood component you only require the serum component or the fluid component so what you do is you just allow the blood to clot and then you take the clear supernatant for detecting the antigen either it is TNF alpha or insulin or any other antigens. You remove the serum and assay immediately or you store them at minus 20 degree you avoid the repeated freeze thaw cycles. So that is very important that you should not do the repeated freeze thaw cycle because that actually is going to reduce the uh, reactivity of the antigen against the antibody. Now step two, you have to prepare the TNF alpha standard dilutions. So what you have to do is you start with the 1000 picogram per ml and then you do the serial dilutions like as we discussed for the indirect ELISA as well and ultimately you are going to get the 15.56 picogram per ml dilutions. So this is exactly what you have to do, you have to start with the stock solutions and then first you prepare the 1000 picogram per ml, you take the 300 microliter, you dilute it and that is how you actually are diluting every time you are diluting half into the individual appendix, and that is how you are going to prepare the complete dilutions. So, you take the whatever the content comes along with the kit into a deionized water to, to get a stock of 30 nanograms per ml and then you can make the dilutions like this and you vertex the mixture so that it is a going to be a homogeneous dilutions and then only you are actually going to prepare the uh, serial dilutions because once you add the th things you have to mix this very thoroughly so that it is actually going to uh, be homogeneous and then only you take out an additional 300 microliter to make the uh, additional uh, dilutions. The step 3 you have to do the coating so add the 100 microliter diluted capturing antibody to each well and then you incubate overnight at 4 degree and aspirate and wash 3 times with the wash buffer. So now you have coated your coating antibodies then you do the blocking so exactly the same way you have to do the blocking so that there will be no non-specific interaction of the antigen to the plastic of that particular well and uh, then you add the 100 microliter of standard uh, TNF alpha or sample and incubate it for room, 2 hours at room temperature. Then in the step 5 you aspirate the sample and wash the plate 5 times with the washing buffer and then step 5 you have to do a detection so add the 100 microliter of the detectors to each well so detector is a staptavidine HRP conjugate incubate for 1 hour at room temperature, aspirate the detector solution, wash it and then you incubate it with the substrate solutions and that actually is going to give you the reactions after 
uh, the some time and that actually can be read out with the help of the spectrophotometer. Now, determination of the TNF alpha level. So, we are just giving you an example of TNF alpha, but that can be done with any antigens. The mean absorbance of the each set of the sample and subtract the background absorbance from the each mean, draw a calibration by plotting the standard TNF alpha concentration against the absorbance. So, you actually absorb, you plot the absorbance on the y axis and you plot the TNF alpha concentration on the x axis and that actually is going to give you a curve and a tip use a regression analysis and you can be able to draw the equation of this particular curve and then the use, use this equation to determine the TNF alpha concentration into the unknown samples. So, this is all about the sandwich ELISA to uh, determine the level of antigen into the patient sample or the biological fluid. Now, this is the competitive ELISA. So, competitive ELISA is actually based on the competition binding for the primary antibody between the target antigen in a sample and the same antigen that is coated onto the multiple plate. In this case, what you are doing? The primary antibody is first added to the sample to form the antigen antibody complexes. The sample is then added to the well that are coated with the target antigen only the unbound primary antibody in the sample can bind to the antigen coated in the well. Hence, the more antigen in the sample, the less antibody is available to bind the antigen in the well resulting in a signal reduction, which means what it what this mean is that you first you make the antigen uh, antibody antigen complexes into the sample. So, what you do is you take the sample, you add the antibody. So, what will happen is the antibody will go and bind to the antigen. So, as I said you know antigen and antibodies are always making a complex in the equimolar ratio. So, suppose you added the 10 microgram of antibody. So, what will happen? The 10 microgram of antibody is actually going to form the complex with the 10 microgram of antigen. So, now imagine that you have the more amount of uh, antibody. So, suppose I added the 100 microgram of anti antibody and the level of antigen present in your sample is only the 20 microgram. So, what will happen is the rest 80 microgram antibodies are still available. So, they will go and bind to the anti antigen what is available onto the plate and that is how they are actually going to give you the readouts. But if you have more amount of antigen, for example, if you have 80 microgram of antigen, then you only have the 20 antibody molecules available, which means as the amount of antigen in the biological fluid is available, it is actually going to keep reducing the available antibody for making an interaction with the antigen which is present onto the plate. This means there will be a competition of antigen between the antigen which is present onto the plate and the antigen what is present onto the sample. And that is why this is called as the uh, uh, competitive ELISA. Uh, either direct or the indirect detection can be used in the competitive ELISA, which means you have an antigen which is actually being coated onto the plate and you have an antibody which is bound to the uh, antigen which is in the sample and then when you add them to this, so antibody plus antigen is, so antigen star is making a complex like antibody antigen star complex. So, when you have the antigen which is coated onto the plate, this antigen is actually less. So, you have the excess antibody and that excess antibody is going to react with this antigen and that is how this antibody has a, a enzyme. So, that actually is going to process the substrate and will give you the color. The advantage of this assay is that it is highly sensitive, it is can be used with the crude sample and you can be able to use the, it, the signal whatever you get can be quantified either by uh, with the serial dilution standard curve. So, you can actually use the different amount of uh, antigen into the solution and that actually will allow you to measure the level of antigen. The disadvantage is that you require a primary antibody which is very very specific for at that particular antigen. It should not have the cross reactive species. 
So, this is all about the antigen antibody interactions. We discuss about the agglutinations, we discuss about the precipitations, we discuss about the radio amino assays, and we discuss about the amino precipitations. Within the amino assay, also, we discuss about the ELISA, and now we are going to discuss about the Western blotting. So, Western blotting is a technique to detect the proteins what is being blotted onto the nitrocellulose membrane. So, the western blotting is a popular technique to detect the specific protein present in the crude lysate or the homogenate. It uses the separation of different proteins in the gel electrophoresis, preferably SDS page and then on the transfer of the proteins onto a solid support such as the nitrocellulose membrane, a primary antibody directed against the protein of the interest and then secondary antibody is used to detect the primary antibody and give either the color or the chemolucent subset. So, what you have is you have the proteins present on the SDS that you transfer onto the nitrocellulose membrane, then you add the primary antibodies, the primary antibody will go and bind to the their uh, target antigens, then you remove the steps with the washing. So, the washing will remove the non-specifically bound antibodies. Then you are going to add the secondary antibodies and that actually is going to bind to the primary antibody and then ultimately you can be able to add the colorimetric substrate or the uh, chemilipsin substrate and that actually is going to give you the signal next to the protein where the anti primary antibody is bound. So, let us see how to perform the western blotting. So, the material what you require, the material what you require is the cells, uh, in this case uh, the E. coli which is over expressing the GFP, you require the protein standards, transfer buffers, transfer membrane like the nitrocellulose membranes, the plastic tray, spatula, blotting sheets, semi dry electro blotting units that is required to electro blot the proteins from the gel to the nitrocellulose membrane, then you require the knee agent for performing the electrophoresis, you require the primary antibodies to detect the GFP into the proteins, you require the secondary antibodies which is coupled with the HRP and then you require the developing reagents. Uh, in the step 1, you have to prepare the samples, so the preparation of the sample depends on the cell type for a tissue first the follicle tissue such as the tumor or the whole liver or the brain, it is first mechanically broken down into the individual cells using a blender and then homogenize it for the sonications. Once the individual cells are obtained, it will be processed as described below. For the cell, individual cells are incubated with the lysis buffer containing detergent along with the protease as well as the phosphate inhibitor cocktail to protect the sample from the degradation. So, the phosphate inhibitor cocktail only you will use if you are interested to probe the antibodies or probe the antigen which is uh, phosphorylated. So, because you do not want the phosphatase to remove the phosphate from the phosphorylated proteins. The step 2, you have to electrophorize the sample. So, your sample was resolved, resolved on the SDS page. Then the step 3, you transfer the protein gel onto the blotting membrane and then the before you do the transferring of the blotting membrane, you have the multiple steps like you have to prepare the transfer membrane. So, you have to cut the membrane into the same size as the gel like if you have a gel of this size, you have to cut the membrane of this size and then the, you have to process the membrane in different way depending on which membrane you are using. So, for example, if you are using the nitrocellulose membrane, Place the membrane in the transfer buffer and observe that the liquid has wicked the membrane. Atrias appeared as a white spot needs a special consideration, which means if you add the transfer buffer, this membrane is going to be completely wet. There will be no white spot present on this membrane, which means this membrane will not be visible. It is actually going to submerge into the transfer buffer and it will take up the same color as your transfer buffer. That will indicate that the membrane is ta has taken up the, uh, the transfer buffer. If you are using the PVDF membrane, which is actually a hydrophobic membrane, then what you have to do is you immerse the membrane into a 100 percent methanol because then you have to do a charging step because the PVDF membrane has to be, because it is a hydrophobic membrane, so it will not bind the protein uh, very nicely. So, it has to be charged with a, uh, with a polar solvent. So, what you have to do is you first incubate the PVDF membrane into 100 percent uh, methanol for some time and then you add the 
transfer buffer and then you add the transfer buffer, the transfer buffer should take up the PVDF uh, the buffer and it should be also does not can show any white color. Decant the methanol and submerge the membrane into a transfer buffer and additional 10 to 30 minutes. So, with this the transfer membrane is going to be ready and then you have to set up the, uh, the electro plotting. So, assembly of the transfer, transfer cassettes. So, what you have to do is remove the stacking gel from the page and incubate the gel in a transfer buffer to 10 to 30 minutes. The place the pair of blotting sheets uh, onto the anode, anode plates. So, a transfer, a transfer operators is having a uh, anode on one side and the cathode on one side and then you have to set up the things like this. You have to first put the filter papers, then you have to keep your nitrocellulose membrane or then you keep your gel and then you keep your transfer membrane or you can do reverse that you put first put the filter paper then you put the gel, then you put the membrane and then you keep the next layer of uh, the filter papers. You have to ensure that there is no bubble present between the gel and the nanocellulose membrane because if there is a bulb, uh, bu there will be a air bubble present, that area is not going to be, uh, will not going to allow the transfer of protein from the gel to the nanocellulose membrane. So, place the transfer membrane onto the top of blotting sheets and remove the trapped air by rolling the test tube or the glass rod. Then you place the page gel on top of membrane and gently remove the trapped air bubble by rolling the test tube. You place the another blotting sheets uh, onto the top and then you remove the trapped air bubble by rolling the test tube or the glass rod and finally keep the cathode plate, usually the red colored uh, cathode plate and tie the transfer cassette by the four screws. So, once you have done that, you have the four screw on all the sides and that actually you are going to put to uh, screw the uh, this particular uh, gel cassette and then you connect it to the uh, electro, uh, to the power card and that actually will allow the transferring of the protein from the gel to the, uh, to the nitrocellulose membrane. Uh, then you transfer the protein from the gel to the membrane plus the place the transfer cassette in the tank filled with the transfer buffer, connect the transfer operators to the power supply and apply the constant voltage. After the transfer, disassemble the whole cassette and carefully remove the transfer membrane and check the transfer by the ponchu stain. Use a pencil and label the different lane which means if you got these lanes and this membrane you have to write the lane number so that that lane number can be used subsequently when you are doing the chemiluminescent uh, development or you are using the autoradiogrammy or any other method this number will actually allow you to identify the particular lane in the step 4 you have to do the blocking the blocking is exactly the same and then step 5 you have to do the probing so in the western blot the probing can be done in two ways in the two step probing you have to first add the primary antibody followed by the secondary antibodies. So, you have to take the uh, appropriate dilution of the primary antibody, you have to add the primary antibody followed by the washing and then you had, have to add the secondary antibodies or in a one step probing what you have to do in one step itself you add the primary antibody which is containing the enzyme which is means the primary antibody which is labeled with the enzyme or the fluorescent probe and that can be used. One step probing is very uncommon because the one step probing does not allow you to do the uh, it, because the sensitivity level is very low with the one step probing. Uh, then you have to do the blot development. There are multiple ways to develop the blot which is uh, present onto the membrane. Uh, you have the HRP based uh, chromogenic substrates like the 4 chloro naphthol DAB or TMB or you can have the alkaline phosphatase enzyme also. Uh, so, you, for that you can use the BCIP NBT system or you have the luminescent substrates like for HRP you have the luminol and H2O2 or for alkaline phosphatase you have the substituted 1,2 dioxane phosphate. So, all these uh, substrate are allowing you to detect the uh, proteins what is being blotted onto the nitrocellulose membrane either you have the chlorometric uh, uh, methods or you have the chemiluminescent methods. Uh, 
so both the methods are actually allowing you to detect the proteins the chlorimetric detection has the lower sensitivity compared to the chemical lucent detections uh, so this is uh, about the western blotting so we have discussed uh, all these steps and then we have also discussed about the how to perform these steps and now to show you how to do these experiment i would like to take you to my lab and where the students are going to perform these experiments where they are actually going to discuss each and every steps how to uh, perform and what are the different steps you should take how to remove the trapped air from the air bubbles or trapped air between the gel and as well as the sandwich how to process the membrane so that it is actually going to be useful for transferring of the proteins from the SDS page to the nitrocellulose membrane or the PVDF membrane and uh, with these steps you will be able to understand the how to perform the western blotting in your laboratories. In this video we will demonstrate you how to do a western blot and uh, uh, how to analyze the result using ACL, electrochemical unit cells substrate. So, here what we will do, we have to run gel first, then we will transfer. The transfer method, how to do the transfer, we will show in this video. In previous video, we have already shown that uh, how to run, how to prepare a SDS page gel and how to run protein samples. So, in this video, particularly we are interested in uh, uh, factors associated with the western blotting. For doing western blot, we need membrane and uh, transfer buffer and uh, the transfer medium. Uh, this one is we use to transfer this gel to membrane. So here membrane can be two kind. One is nitrocellulose which has low uh, protein binding efficiency and hydrophilic in nature. Another membrane is PVDF. This is hydrophobic membrane and uh, higher protein binding capacity. So the processing for uh, western blood is different from different for uh, nitrocellulose and PVDF. If you are using PVDF membrane, we have to take, we have to cut the part either if you have ready made uh, pre cut uh, pre cut bloods then no need if you have if you are taking from a uh, bundle you have to cut precisely how many wells you want so after that you have to label front on the blood where that front side can be used for transferring the protein and that can be used in previous step uh, further steps also like uh, uh, antibody incubation. So here for uh, if you want to use PVDF membrane you have to charge with the methanol. So since the PVDF is a hydrophobic membrane you cannot directly uh, transfer the transfer in the aqueous medium. First you have to keep in uh, methanol for at least 20 minutes. So after this can be called as charging. So after this we will use that for uh, transfer. So this is pre-soaked in methanol and uh, equilibrated, equilibrated in uh, transfer buffer. So here while doing uh, uh, transfer we need to consider few things. The buffer always should be in chilled condition. Otherwise during this transfer at high voltage it will generate high temperatures. So that may degrade your protein or decrease the efficiency of the transfer. That's why we need to keep the buffer always in chilled condition. And uh, let's start the procedure. So uh, we need a pre-run gel. So we already finished the gel running. In addition to that, we also need sponges which will give cushion to the uh, gel so that uh, gel may not uh, destroyed during the transfer. So this is this is the cassette we'll use for the uh, transfer. So this is uh, 
negative side of cassette and this is the positive side so we are going to keep gel on negative side and positive side the blood uh, membrane so when we when we apply voltage from this side to this side the negative protein it will be transferred it will be moved to positive side of uh, positive side and it will be uh, captured in the uh, membrane so first for doing that these sponges we need to keep and also this uh, maybe give some uh, non specific uh, binding to membrane so what we will do we will put blotting sheets on top of this so after this you have to remove air bubbles if any present so once uh, you inserted the blotting sheet then you have to keep your gel so here when we have to remember that gel after finishing the uh, sds phase running you have to keep in uh, transfer buffer so that it will give identical condition or equilibration kind of thing during transfer so that uh, protein transfer may be easy so this is the gel and keeping on the negative side so after that we have to overlay with the membrane next we have to remove any air bubbles if present we have to overlay with another blotting sheet and remove the air bubbles each and every time when you introduce something you have to remove air bubbles so this is the final sheet so this is the positive side of the cassette just have to keep like this these are the screws we have to tighten it up then only the contact between the gel and the membrane will be sufficient to uh, get transferred first you don't tight initially you just keep and after that press the positive side of the cassette then tight the screws so all these things should be done in the transfer buffer only unless specified so this is the chilled transfer buffer now we are going to do transfer pour sufficient buffer and keep uh, this ice pack also if the chilling is not sufficient then uh, there may be heat generation so in order to prevent that we will use this ice pack so this will keep uh, the buffer cool till the transfer end of the transfer so uh, once that is over you directly take out the cassette and keep if there is a buffer insufficiency you can add on top of that make sure that uh, the cassette completely submerged so that the transfer will be proper and uh, there is no air bubbles so once the setup is over now you can transfer now transfer is going so how much voltage we need to give 
it depends on uh, uh, transfer to transfer it varies generally in our lab we will give at least 2 hours of transfer at uh, 120 volts which is sufficient to uh, transfer even low molecular weight proteins also but uh, from instrument to instrument also it varies we need you needed to optimize before uh, doing uh, transfer after two hours we have to uh, remove the blood and uh, incubate with the uh, blacking buffer so we i am going to stop here remove the cassette keep the net ray remove the screws properly gently remove the sponges take out the blood and keep it in blacking buffer in this condition we have to keep if you are keeping it room temperature it is for two hours at least if you are keeping in four degrees celsius you can keep overnight the blocking buffer contains skim milk uh, or bsa along with the queen 20. the western blood transfer it's all depends on the efficiency how precisely you are doing the transfer for example you should not use your bare hands while handling the blood or uh, gel so whatever the proteins present on uh, your fingers it will transfer into uh, gel or membrane which will give high background during development of the blood so always use gloves apart from that uh, while handling the instrument to make sure that there may be possibility of uh, 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 electricity the shock uh, may happen sometime so we have to that time also we need to use gloves and after uh, finishing uh, finishing the transfer you have to clean all the apparatus properly and dry it for the next time use after the blocking of the membrane we have to remove the membrane and incubate with the primary antibody without washing the main purpose of the blocking is that it will occupy non-specific sites other than the respective protein so that when antibody comes it will bind to that uh, specific protein and gives no nice so after this we will incubate with the primary antibody for uh, overnight at 4 degrees celsius then wash three times at least 15 minutes each with the uh, tbst buffer or pbst buffer and uh, again treat with incubate with the secondary antibody suitable secondary antibody for uh, 5 hours at 4 degrees celsius or 2 hours at uh, 3 hours at room temperature after that we need to wash properly at least 3 times then we will develop with the develop the blood with the electrochemical limits and substrate in earlier uh, western blood how to do western blood video we showed how to transfer the proteins to uh, membrane so uh, we are we incubated with the uh, primary antibody following secondary antibody and wash with the now here we show how to develop a blood for developing a blood we need chemical luminescent substrate in most of the commercially available kits luminar uh, luminal is the luminal is the one of the substrate we use for this purpose so luminal in presence of hydrogen peroxide and uh, peroxidase engine which present in the uh, secondary antibody uh, horse radius peroxidase conjugated secondary antibody this horse radius peroxidase converts luminal to uh, excited state luminal by deprotonating and oxidizing it so this product uh, this excited state product gradually uh, leaves the energy by releasing 
uh, lumens and photons. That light will be detected using this instrument. So uh, these are the commercially available uh, chemiluminescent substrate uh, solutions. So it is available from a wide range of companies. So we have to mix one is to one ratio. So we have to uh, take out the blood, drain the buffer, whatever present, properly. So after that, we keep blood in between uh, a plastic paper foils then we will take chemiluminescent substrate So after that, have to slowly press and remove the air bubbles. This is the tray we use it for uh, developing the blood. So we have to open the system properly align the uh, tray then shift blood to the tail. Once it is over, you have to just close. Here we have to select application. We want bloods that is chemiluminescent and uh, what exposure want. You have two options manual auto. Auto in auto two options are there optimal auto exposure rapid auto exposure we will choose optimal auto exposure so you can uh, enlarge the uh, blood also once it is over you just say so this is the developed blood so as we can see uh, the bands bands pattern so this is how we develop uh, western blood uh, through electrochemiluminescent substrate so in this video we demonstrated how to transfer uh, proteins to a blood and what are the precautions need to be taken while doing the western blood and also how to develop the blood and what is the laying principle behind the developing the blood so hope I hope this will help you to understand the uh, basic outlaying mechanism of how Western blood works. So with this uh, uh, we have discussed uh, the demo of the, uh, the uh, Western blotting and in that Western blotting demo the student have discussed many aspects related to the Western blotting. So with this uh, we have discussed uh, about the antigen antibody interactions, we discuss about the agglutination reactions, we discuss about the precipitation reactions and then uh, lastly we have also discussed about the different types of immunoassays like ELISA as well as the western blotting. So with this I would like to conclude our lecture here, in the subsequent lecture we are going to discuss few more immunoassays related to this particular immunology and we are also going to see how those tools are uh, helpful in answering the different types of biological problems. So with this I would like to conclude my lecture here, thank you. <music>